Hi, this is John Kinzer with part two of the lecture, uh, lesson 10. And we pick up uh, after our brief introduction about Washington and the French and Indian War. So we mentioned that now it is 1755, and the English have decided to oust the French from the Ohio country, they call it, and it's uh, particularly uh, Fort Duquesne. And so this Fort Duquesne um, campaign is uh, uh, led by General Edward Braddock. He was a major general in the British Army and very uh, 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 gentlemanly, uh, very military bearing, very strong, uh, capable general. But he had a couple flaws as he brought his men to Virginia and they landed at... Um, Alexandria, which is just a little south of Washington, D.C., and then he marched his men to Winchester, and they have a route that they followed, some back roads that went to Winchester West, and today these roads are known as Braddock Road. You can see Braddock Road as it goes through Springfield and Annandale and Alexandria today, and uh, so uh, Braddock Road is the route they marched, and they <clears throat> reached uh, Winchester, which was on the edge of the wilderness. Uh, Winchester was uh, the departing point. There was a fort there, and there George Washington joined them with about 450 uh, American uh, militia, Virginia militia, so Braddock had a force of about 1,200 men, and Washington's force uh, of 450 militia, and uh, they joined together in Winchester. Well, we're going to see one of the more spectacular defeats that the British ever um, had uh, in just a moment, but let's take a look at this map first of all. There's three rivers, the Allegheny, the Monongahela, and the Ohio. Of course, the Ohio runs over into the Mississippi Valley. Where these three rivers meet is uh, where modern Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania is, and the French at that time were building this uh, fort, Fort Duquesne, and the fort was right there at that meeting point. And today, of course, Pittsburgh has Three River Stadium, and you understand why the Steelers uh, play in that Three River Stadium with this geography. Now, uh, Winchester is quite a bit below, but uh, Braddock began moving very slowly north. He was moving at a route of about two miles per day, and he put his lumberjacks out front. They chopped the wood, and they cleared a path that was about 10 to 12 feet wide through the woods, and they laid the logs down uh, parallel across the road and made what was known uh, then as a corduroy road. It was a bumpy road as you took a wagon across, but it was a road that was very uh, dry, and, uh, and, of course, it rains a lot, and they went through deep, deep woods. So they move at a very, at what we would call a snail's pace, uh, north, about two miles per day. So the French and the Indians knew they were coming. They had time to lay up uh, an ambush, and George Washington, of course, was very up on that. He understood that was probably what they were going to to do, and so uh, as uh, they uh, allowed the British to move uh, close to uh, Fort uh, Duquesne, there's a little creek that runs into the uh, uh, Monongahela, and it's called uh, Turkey Run, and uh, 
as they got close to Turkey Run, uh, the, the, uh, the Americans were wondering when would the uh, attack start. The British, marching in file with their bright red uniforms and their white crossed uh, knapsacks uh, across their chest, kind of making a nice white X, like shoot me here type of X, um, they were sitting ducks as they came through the woods. Uh, Washington uh, filed a, uh, a report with Braddock and, and pled that they put out militia in a, a skirmish line out in front to uh, find out if there was any a formation of enemy troops. Uh, they knew that uh, there, there probably was, and Braddock refused. He knew that the British fought very well in open field, and he was merely moving his men to that position where they would deploy and they would win a battle in an open uh, European-style attack. So the uh, long wagon train that, wa uh, that Braddock brought along uh, stretched behind his force, and the 16, 1,700 men are moving forward. Now, George Washington was the second in command, and they reached Turtle Creek. Did I say Turkey Creek, I believe? Uh, the actual name is Turtle Creek. They got across Turtle Creek, um, where about two-thirds of the force made the crossing, and that's when the attack came. So the French and the Indians just uh, fell on the sides of this a column, and uh, it was awful. The uh, British were cut down. General Braddock was shot off his horse, uh, mortally wounded, and a retreat began that turned into a rout, and the, and the troops began running. Uh, George Washington had four horses shot from under him, uh, excuse me, three horses shot from under him. He had four bullet holes through his uh, coat, but he was not touched. And so the legend of the bulletproof George Washington comes from this battle. Uh, Washington took control, uh, put skirmishers out, uh, and met the, uh, and of course the Americans knew how to fight these Indians. And so they prevented uh, this rout from becoming a, a complete destruction of the army. The British kept running for miles all through the night. There was uh, the sounds of massacre and scalping of the British, and uh, Braddock's uh, own body was buried in the road and uh, had wagons rolled over across the top of it so it would just uh, wipe out any trace that there was a grave there because the Indians, the Americans knew, would try to dig up the body and eat the heart to take on the strength or the courage of the great commander. So it was a grisly night. Uh, George Washington said the order of burial uh, while Braddock was buried, and, uh, and then he was uh, in command and uh, just tried to uh, bring as many troops back as he could after this massive uh, ambush. Well, the the actual casualties, the British lost about 800 of their 1,200 men. This is a huge um, loss for Britain. And the Americans lost, um, I think it was about 100 of the 450 militiamen. And uh, so it was a huge defeat for England. And um, the British uh, were pushed out, and the French went on to build a great fortification there, Fort Duquesne, which uh, was uh, uh, an anchor and supplied the Indians with all kinds of uh, war material so they could scalp and, and raid on the frontiers during this war. So the French used the Indians to, to uh, harass the Americans, and, uh, and this was just uh, the, the condition uh, that lasted throughout uh, the war.
There were two other major actions in the French and Indian War, which was the name, of course, for the war here in North America. It was known as the Seven Years' War worldwide. The other uh, actions uh, were in 1758, the British finally mount an expedition again against uh, Duquesne. It was led by General John Forbes, and he landed his army in Philadelphia and then moved very uh, cautiously across the state of Pennsylvania and built a series of forts, uh, each fort being about 10 or 12 miles from the next one. And so he had a string of forts that he fortified. Of course, the, the French and Indians knew he was coming. Uh, one of these forts was Fort Ligonier, and that was in central Pennsylvania. And uh, that's the, the, the ministry, uh, they, they've had that name taken by the ministry of, uh, of uh, boy, I can't think of his name now, but a famous uh, <laughs> uh, Bible teacher. And Ligonier Ministries uh, uh, is is become kind of famous in Christian circles, but um, this expedition moved across and and slowly came up upon Fort Duquesne. Uh, the night before the battle would be taking place, the British went into encampment and uh, anticipated the battle the next day. George Washington was eager. He'd been very excited and hopeful to gain revenge against the French for uh, he had so much tied up in this uh, area of Virginia. And uh, uh, that night, uh, they heard a massive explosion. The sky lit up to the west. And uh, the next morning, as they came down upon the fort, it was a smoldering ruin the French and Indians had blown the fort up. They had taken all the cannon, and uh, they had escaped. Washington was crushed. He, uh, at that point in his journal, vowed that he would never, ever serve in the army again. He uh, was completely uh, disappointed and and how unfair this whole matter turned out. Uh, little did he know that he would be participating again, and that this experience really was a formative experience uh, to shape him for the command that he would have with the American army. Uh, in 1759, just uh, to mention, the Battle of Quebec took place, and uh, this was a major defeat for the French. The British floated their fleet up the St. Lawrence River to Quebec, and then in the middle of the night, uh, dropped anchor and, uh, and uh, uh, put their army on the north shore of the, which is just below the heights of Quebec, and in darkness scaled this great cliff and pulled their entire army up onto this flat area near the city called the Plain of Abraham. And then the next day, the French made the mistake of coming out of Quebec and fighting the British on the Plain of Abraham. And, of course, the uh, everything, the morale, the, uh, the whole uh, momentum of the fight had gone to the British, who had surprised the French, and the French uh, were defeated. Uh, both generals, both General Montcalm, who was the French general, and General Wolfe, the British general, were both wounded and died in the battle. and uh, But the fall of Quebec sealed the fate of the, of the French, and now the British had a chokehold on the St. Lawrence River. The uh, fortress of Fort Niagara and some of the French forts further inland would fall because now ships could not come in and, and supply uh, the further forts to the west. So... The war ends in 1761. It's in 1763 that the Treaty of Paris is signed and France loses all of Canada. And so the British have their uh, everlasting foe uh, pushed away 
and uh, the French really lose everything in North America. They may, I think they retain uh, an island or two in the Caribbean, but because they're pushed out, uh, they now give Spain uh, part of their uh, empire, uh, the southwest region, and so uh, the British now own all the way to the Mississippi, and they own Canada. Uh, so those are big, big uh, gains for Britain as a result of this war. So let's consider some of the other things that George Washington is notable for. I mentioned on the outline that he was a far-sighted statesman. Uh, he chose, for instance, the site of Washington, D.C. Uh, as a strategic site, as well as an important site for regional balance. It was the logical point for the opening of the West because the Potomac River uh, came from the West. And Washington was even uh, interested in making a canal, and, uh, which he did, uh, along the edge of the Potomac River. And, uh, and what the idea was to open up the interior of the country and have goods and products floated down the river. He, he foresaw that. He wanted Washington, D.C. to be an industrial um, uh, area that, that had a lot of jobs and, uh, and provided um, a lot of balance for the country. He recognized there would be trouble from the Articles of Confederation. Uh, it was a weak government. There was a trouble in it because also there was a deep split between the slave and the free colonies, and uh, the country might have split over this uh, this uh, at the time. As a surveyor, he also saw the importance of these vast coal deposits in Virginia and in West Virginia. He saw that the capital should be a place of industry, a port, and a place where coal was available for a manufacturing center, and this would help bind the North and the South together. Uh, this would encourage free labor, and slavery, he believed, would gradually disappear. Later, D.C., uh, District of Columbia, was modeled after Versailles, the big French capital, and so it was a very grand uh, scale, big wide boulevards, circles, DuPont Circle, Farragut Square, different uh, circles and squares in the city, as well as this big mall, which looked beautiful today, but George Washington's idea was ignored. And so he was, uh, uh, you know, he, he had that far-sighted uh, vision that was important. I think, in, in a way, that far-sighted vision also called him to uh, start a very stable country when he was president. He focused on getting the debt uh, down. He believed that um, the country had to have um, neutrality as its policy so we wouldn't be dragged into wars um, across Europe and, and across the world. 